We are here with our very special guest, Hillsboro filmmaker Grace Beeler, who's been working on this amazing project for a while, uh, called What Comes Out Goes to the Government, Condominial Sewerage in Brazil, started out as a school project and uh, has now morphed into something bigger. Good morning, Grace Beeler. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. So let's start uh, talking about the genesis of this project. Uh, first of all, how did you get onto it? And then uh, uh, how was it that you decided to make a documentary? And uh, walk us through the whole sort of evolution of this. Okay. Well, um, it started out because I teach English as a second language to adults. I've been doing that for quite a number of years. I teach at Durham Tech now. Um, but I was in Ithaca, New York, teaching adults there. And uh, most of my students are refugees and undocumented immigrants, who many of them should qualify as refugees. Um, about eight years ago, I had a family come in from Burma, um, and they had gotten burned out of their village. Uh, the military came and burned their, their whole village down, and they just had time to grab their kids and a bag of rice. And they had to walk for about three months through the jungle, avoiding these wild elephants that would grab tree trunks and try to hit them and landmines and all kinds of crazy stuff. And when they finally got across the border into Thailand and got into a refugee camp, one of their kids died from drinking water that was contaminated by human waste. Um, so I hear crazy stories every day at work. I mean, everybody leaves their country because of something, right? <clears throat> Most of the time, I feel like there's nothing I can do about it. I can't stop the war in Syria. I can't do anything about the drug cartels in Central America that are sending so many people fleeing the violence there. But I thought maybe I can do something about this, you know. Um, so I went back to do a master's in international studies at NC State. Um, and I was focusing in water and sanitation. Uh, and... At NC State and any of the universities here, there's an agreement between the universities, so you can take classes at UNC and Duke. So I was taking some public health classes at UNC, and I was in a class on uh, water and sanitation in lesser developed countries there. And I was I, I joined the sanitation participatory sanitation working group, um, and because I, I was thinking about refugee camps, you know, like what can you do about those kind of crowded situations where people are just thrown together? The participatory sanitation work group at UNC? At UNC in that class, Well, yeah. there you go. Isn't that uh, <laughs> convenient that they had that? Well, since it, it, I mean, we, we sort of, in the class, we kind of divided up into what your interest was. You know, you could choose water or sanitation and... And so I was interested in something that that would be able to solve that problem of, t of tightly packed um, neighborhoods. Um, and so I started to do a little research about Brazil. I said to myself, you know, I think I bet Brazil has figured this out. And I say that because I've been traveling to Brazil for the last 20 years. I'm married to a Brazilian and we go every few years and I've seen dramatic decreases in poverty over the last 20 years in Brazil. They've, they've really done an amazing job. I, I, you know, they're not a third world country anymore. Um, they've developed a lot. And so I did some research and I found out that they do have something called condominial sewage in Brazil that can serve urban slums. And I'm sure you're aware they don't have it everywhere. I mean, you remember the Olympics, right? Right, <laughs> In course. Rio, the water was polluted. But there are a few cities in the Northeast that have installed this and two that have put it in citywide, and it's working great. Um, so in this group, there was a woman from Jakarta, Indonesia. She worked for the water and sanitation company in Jakarta, um, and she was there doing her master's. And she said to me, I, I bet that this would work in Jakarta, but I don't have enough information in English to convince my boss. So I said, okay, well, I'll go to Brazil, and I'll ask them, and then I'll bring it back to you, and it'll be in English, so you can bring it to your boss in Jakarta. So that was kind of the beginning of the project. And then in that class, we watched a lot of little films on different projects around the world. So I told the professor, well, I can make a little film on this. Um, you can use it in your class. Uh, <coughs> and so he said, sure. Um, so that's how it started. Um, and I thought... Make a little film. I right. thought I was going to make a little film, maybe 15 minutes or something. 
um, I went back to my advisor and said, oh, I want to I want to do my capstone project. I want to make it as a film. And she said, no, you have to write your paper. You can do it as an independent project. <laughs> so I, I wrote the paper, which was good because I, I had to read and, and research everybody that I was going to interview. And I had a, a good idea of what the problems might be and, and a good list of questions after I did my research. Um, and then... I was lucky enough to get a Hope Foundation grant of $4,000, and I crowdfunded another $3,500. Um, and I went a year and a half ago to Brazil to film. And I was super lucky at that point because the dollar was almost four to one. Wow, which it was meant a strong dollar. It was a strong dollar, which meant that I could afford to hire two professional documentary filmmakers in Brazil. I thought I was just going to go down and film some interviews to be used for the class. But these guys make documentary film, right? So, so they're filming beautiful things, <laughs> lots of it. And, and we were th- I was there for 11 days shooting, and I had all my interviews set up and everything all ready to go before I went. Everyone, everyone said, oh, my gosh, they're only showing up on time because you're American, right? But everyone came exactly when they were <laughs> supposed to do it. Everyone, everything worked out beautifully. And about two days in, one of the filmmakers said to me, this is really interesting. This could be a real film. You know, when you're done with your academic project, let's fundraise and make this into a real movie. So I came back. I had the money to to pay for the filmmakers, but I didn't have the money to pay for a professional editor. So at that point, I had to edit the film myself, and I'd never edited anything before. So you had never made a film before. No, no, I hadn't. <laughs> so you're a total rookie going in yeah. there. You do have a couple of professional filmmakers down in Brazil. How did you find those guys? It was, that was pure luck also. I was just looking on the internet and, I, you know, I found some people who do like video weddings and stuff and that didn't really look like what I wanted. And I found some people who did really kind of um, fast paced television like stuff and that didn't look like what I wanted either. But I found this this organization. Actually, it's a kind of like WHUP. They're starting their own um, local TV station. And um, and they do it's kind of a nonprofit and they also teach teenagers how to make documentary film and they're artists and they like making interesting, beautiful documentary films. So I emailed the guy at this TV station and he said, oh, sounds interesting. Sure, I'll do it. And so, you know, he was in Salvador. I was originally planning on working with someone here in Hillsborough who is also married to a Brazilian. He speaks Portuguese. But when I looked at my budget, I just didn't have enough money to fly him down. So I thought, okay, let me find someone there so I don't have to pay for that plane ticket. And it was it was great luck. I mean, they really shot a beautiful thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they shot a lot of footage. They shot a lot. <laughs> and then you decided to tackle the editing process yourself. Uh, and you came out with uh, a, a tiny little hour and a half uh, production. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I came back and I That's had... That's a full-length right, feature, a, full right? Length okay. Film. I had to finish the film by the end of the semester. I went in January. I came back February 2nd, and then I had to finish it by May, which I didn't manage to do. I actually took an incomplete and finished it in August. But um, I had about 60 to 70 hours of footage that they had shot because I didn't even realize, I thought I was hiring one guy, but then a second guy showed up. So I had two cameras going all the time. <laughs> so there was a lot of footage I hadn't even seen, a lot of surprises that, of beautiful stuff. That one camera was off in the other place, and, and one guy got into it, and he was interviewing people, and I didn't even see the interviews until I got back. Um, so, yeah, so then I was tasked with the project of editing, and, and you know, they pointed me to the right editing program, and they said, use this. <coughs> and um, my, I also, I have a... 15 year old he's 16 now but he was 15 then who has his own youtube channel so he, if i got stuck he'd just say oh mom do it like this <laughs> <laughs> or i'd go on youtube and thankfully youtube has the answer for everything so anytime i got stuck there was some guy on youtube that would show me how to do it um and i feel like the the film that i have online right now is great it's being used on the unc mooc um for that class and and then the mooc goes to thousands of people around the world um in developing countries so it but it's it's a film that's made for students who are in that class in that right. water and sanitation class so it's got a lot of details it's a lot of talking and you know um yeah it's not slick but uh uh certainly it, it uh is of a much higher quality than one might expect uh from a, a first time 
a filmmaker who had no idea what she was doing. It's actually uh, stuff. It's really interesting stuff. Uh, but the subject itself is really interesting. So, uh, of course, sanitation being a huge uh, global problem, clean water, hard to come by in so many places, and uh, sewage is just uh, uh, an ongoing mess, so to speak, uh, for so many people. Uh, how many people, uh, roughly, would you say uh, lack proper sanitation and uh, clean water facilities? So right now the number is 2.4 billion. 2.4 billion people. And so you were looking at a model, basically, of how uh, this can be addressed uh, in a compact community, because uh, that's part of it, and it's different from a rural community. In a compact urban environment, you can't just uh, dig up uh, the streets and, and lay sewer line. And so you uh, found this uh, project, which allows the government to partner with local organizations and, and the community to uh, do it for a um, um, much more uh, cost-effective uh, uh, figure. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, right now, the conventional sewage system that we use in this country, there's no way to install that in urban slums. You, not only is it too expensive, you just can't fit the machines in to get between the houses to dig those ditches. There's no space, so cities just ignore those neighborhoods. So with this model, you can actually serve those neighborhoods. Um, and what is the model? How does it work? So it, it basically, it, it begins with conventional sewage and it modifies it. So it's not a huge change. It just takes um, changing things a little bit. So um, one thing is here, sewage lines have to go really deep because we need to go below the frost line. Well, in Brazil, they didn't even know what I was talking about when I said <laughs> the pipes freeze. They just looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> so at some point they said, why are we going so deep? And they looked at each other and said, I don't know. Let's go shallower. <clears throat> most of the de the developing world doesn't have the issue of, of freezing pipes. So you can go um, a foot down and it's protected enough that, that it won't break, especially if you change, instead of going down under the whole street, you go under the sidewalk. And that, um, that means that you don't have to make it, you can use PVC pipe instead of huge metal pipes because you don't have to withstand um, car traffic. And it also means because the ditches are so shallow, you can have neighborhood people digging those ditches for you. Um, they also, they save a lot of pipe. It's just small modifications for, you know, let's save 20% of the pipe here by going under the sidewalk. Or if we go behind the houses, we can save 30 or 40% of the pipe. Um, and in very tightly neighborhoods, like in Salvador, in, in Bahia, um, where the houses are really just built on top of each other, right next to each other. They'll often have to string it from one house down through somebody else's kitchen under their floor and down, down the side of the house and then through somebody else's window. You know, it's kind of cobbled together. And that takes sometimes changing the laws because that would be illegal here right. and illegal in a lot of places with zoning laws. But once you present it to a city government and say this is a way that you can serve these, these neighborhoods that are not being served, let's talk about changing these laws, then it can work. Now, um, uh, how do you, uh, once you've got the, the main lines laid uh, in the streets or in the neighborhoods, then you have to tie in each individual uh, dwelling to those lines. That's a different uh, kind of headache. You're having to create the tie-ins. Um, uh, how how is that a whole different uh, kind of operation? That no, that it actually starts with the neighborhoods. So the reason it's called condominial is because uh, the guy who invented it started thinking about uh, in Brazil. A lot of people live in apartment buildings in condominiums where they'll own their own apartment, and he thought, what if we took the condominium idea and laid it on its side? So that goes so like one city block or one group of houses is a condominium, and those people come up with the solution together. They, so they have to have a meeting within that block to form their condominium. And they choose a leader on their block who's going to interact with the water and sanitation company. Um, and so the engineers will go and say, here are two or three different solutions that you could use. And these are the different costs. Either you can maintain it yourself or we can maintain it for you. You know, it'll be cheaper if you maintain it yourself. And so the, that group of houses decides together. And once they've made that decision, then they go to the water and sanitation company and say, we're going to do this. Or 
they say, no, we can't agree, we're not going to do anything. And then the water and sanitation company will ignore them and go to all the blocks around them and just let them let peer pressure work on them. Eventually, they'll figure it out. So those people figure out their solution. Um, and then they come and, and are sort of served as a, as a block. And uh, you have a, a lot of interviews. I, I noted a few of them in the film uh, where uh, you're interviewing people who have benefited from this, who didn't have it before. And, of course, they're ranting and raving about how amazing it is and how much better it is. Because if you think about it, having uh, clean water and, uh, and sewer, sewer uh, facilities is, uh, is a big deal, especially when uh, – the stuff isn't just running through the streets, which it otherwise does, because there's yeah. no place for it to go. And running into the ocean uh, or the rivers or whatever waterway is closest. Uh, and uh, what kind of a response have you received now? You've got this uh, work in progress because you, you are now, uh, you have the, the raw documentary that you've boiled down from your uh, many hours of footage to about an hour and a half. Um, and you've been showing it, and it's available online. What what kind of response are you seeing? Oh, hearing? people are excited about it. It's it's really cool because um, you know people in the English speaking world have kind of known that this existed. There were some things written in English about it, but not enough to actually know how it worked. So now, when people are seeing it, they're starting to think, "Oh, this might work." Um, I just uploaded the film that I have. Uh, to Susanna.org, which is a, an international water and sanitation um, forum. And last week I got an email from a guy in Karachi, Pakistan, which has the largest urban slum in the world. And he said, this is really interesting. I think this could work here. Um, do you have a, a maintenance report for me? And I said, well, there's one guy in Brasilia who speaks English, and here's his email. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's kind of what I was hoping for, is that I can help to spread the idea and, and make it work. That's yeah. incredible, the power of one person to make a huge difference on a rather uh, large scale from right here in town. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. Now, you are raising funds uh, for this a uh, professional editor, so they can uh, sort of reconfigure it as uh, a documentary that is for public consumption. Uh, you had a $14,000 goal to start with. You have a uh, GoFundMe campaign going. You got ten grand from the Inter American Development Bank. That was a nice grant. I'm it sure was. that was. Uh, when you got that. I'm sure you were jumping up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, you were trying to raise the rest of it. You're only. $881 shy of your goal, um, and you were the uh, driving force behind Flush Fest, which we were uh, promoting last week. How did that go? Oh, Flush Fest was amazing. It was really fun. <laughs> the whole community came out. I, the people in Brazil just couldn't believe it when I told them the whole town is coming out to support this project. <laughs> um, we had a lot of fun. My neighbor, Peter Estep, offered his house and his property um, for a music festival. This was his idea. He said, let's have a music festival. I know some musicians. We can invite them over. And, and I said, sure, I know some musicians too. So um, we invited all the musicians we knew, and pretty much all of them said yes. And we had a full lineup from noon until 11 p.m. We had music going on the front porch and in the backyard, and we had music and films happening inside. He's got a grand piano inside. It was amazing, and a lot of people came. I made $3,000, a little more than $3,000, which is a, a phenomenal. And a lot of local businesses donated door prizes or food. It was incredible. The nickel donated 15 dozen wings. How about <laughs> you know? the wooden nickel? Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and now you have just a little bit uh, to go. Have you hired the editor? Do you know who yes, you're going I, to use? Yes, I have the editor, and he's already got the material. Um, and I'm going to be going down to Brazil in July, well, in June, at the end of June. And then I'll spend the first two weeks of July with him, um, sitting down and working with him, you know, talking about ideas. And then we'll finish it up. He'll send me cuts online after that because I can't spend longer than that with him. Right. So he is down there. You hired, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I need I need a Brazilian guy. local because everything's in Portuguese, and these filmmakers. I mean, someone that they work with and they're comfortable with him, and he does really good work. You know, the, the films that he's made are beautiful. So. And you need to support the local economy exactly. down there as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they appreciate the uh, the work. Uh, you speak Portuguese. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, fluently, I, I gather from some of the conversations I was hearing with a woman's voice in the background, that would have been you. So um, some of it was me, and I do show up in the film speaking Portuguese some of the time, but uh, a lot of it also the the people when it was someone asking questions that was my husband's cousin who's an environmental engineer she had just graduated from her program and um, she helped me make the film so I was really lucky to have her on board because she's a native Portuguese speaker and an engineer (laughs) wow you know Uh, Grace Beeler our special guest filmmaker um, sort of by accident uh, but making a documentary Uh, why the title it's an interesting title uh, it's again called What Comes Out Goes to the Government, Condominial Sewerage in Brazil. Now we know about the condominial part, but uh, why What Comes Out Goes to the Government? That was um, the very first night that Luisa and I, Luisa's my husband cousin, um, arrived in Salvador. Neither of us had ever been there before. The filmmaker met us and he took us out to eat a local um, f- seafood stew. It had kind of everything thrown in it. And it was amazing. And uh, as we were sitting there, the waiter came up and he said to us, oh, my mother always said to me, eat, eat, my son. What comes out goes to the government. And we thought that was really hilarious because that was our first night doing this documentary. And it was exactly what we were going to do. (laughs) So we thought about, oh, too bad we didn't have the camera right then. And we thought about going back and seeing if he could retell the story in the end. Um, I don't know if you watched all the way through, but at the very end, in between the credits, I have the filmmakers telling that story so that we, you know, kind of explains the title. Nice. Well, we know what comes out, uh, where that comes from, certainly. Um, and so this uh, experiment's been going on since the 1990s, and now you're bringing it to uh, uh, international uh, attention. This is just incredible. Grace Beeler. Uh, What's left as far as fundraising? Uh, the GoFundMe campaign, by the way, you can still make a contribution. Uh, just uh, look up what comes out. If you go to the GoFundMe.com page, what comes out, that will take you to uh, Grace Beeler's site. Or just look up Grace Beeler and what comes out on uh, line, and it will direct you to the GoFundMe campaign. Uh, you have just a little ways to go. You're you're I close do. to the finish line. I am super close. And on the morning of Flesh Fest, I got these two incredible gifts that I don't even quite know what to do with. Um, Casey Hayes, who's a, a massage therapist, body worker, gave me a gift certificate for two hours of massage. It's worth about $150 to give as a gift to someone who, who gives a larger contribution. Okay, nice. And, and then also I have her partner gave me uh, a gift certificate for five hours of genealogy research, which is worth $300. So yes. um, I have these two certificates, and I would really love to give them to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody's interested. <laughs> In exchange for a donation, if you want uh, to know about your past, a five-hour genealogy consultation from Branching Out Ancestry, and a two-hour massage, not just one hour, a two-hour massage from master body worker Casey Hayes. Just go to the GoFundMe.com site and what comes out, and uh, you can make that donation. Help Grace uh, get over the finish line. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Good luck. We look for uh, the finished product. Uh, what are you going to do with it? So my hope is... Um Aside from bringing it to theaters and film festivals, what I really want to do with this film is bring it to water and sanitation companies in the developing world. I want to have something that looks really nice and is really interesting that um, people who work in those companies and the policymakers who make the laws and decisions can see and get excited about this idea and think this this is something that we could do. Um, so... In addition to the film, I'm also working on setting up a condominial sewage institute. Um, I'm working with a couple of the engineers I interviewed, and the Inter-American Development Bank is interested in helping us with this, too. So we want to bring the film around the world and bring people to Brazil so they can see what it looks like and learn how to do it. Great. Well, good luck with all of that. Grace Beeler, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.